reversals and running your winners. Um, that's today's sort of title, I think. It's Charlie Burton here, and it's Wednesday the 26th. So, um, a few weeks ago, I talked about key reversal bars. Um, I think the title of the video was uh, Interesting Candlestick Pattern or something like that. And it just so happens to be that we now currently, this is a monthly chart of the S&P futures, that we're, we've only got three days to the end of the month. And unless it rallies quite a lot, which it could do, um, but it, unless it rallies quite a lot, then we'll end up with a key reversal bar uh, on the monthly chart. So that's where we've made a new high and then close below the low of the previous bar. So that would be a key reversal bar. Generally speaking, you expect some follow through from a key reversal bar. Remember, if you go back to that video I did um, just a few weeks ago, you can have a look at that and, and I went through a load of stuff with you then. In fact, the S&P did, futures did do a key reversal bar on the daily charts just uh, a week ago. It wasn't the nicest of looking ones, but it made a new high and it did close below the low of the previous bar. So, but it because it had this big lower wick, you know, it's not the nicest of looking of key, key reversal bars, but it, you know, it actually qualifies. So, um, do look at these. I said this a few weeks ago, and um, because if you get a key reversal bar, there usually is some follow through. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if uh, the S&P could finish, let's say it closed like, as we are at the end of this month, that it couldn't then next month do a really decent bounce. But then it would still then come off because we've still got the key reversal bar. So it's possible that that could happen. It could then hold up for a month or two and then come back off again. Who knows? But um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it immediately has to follow through because it's just a bar and sometimes the next bar will bounce and then it will come back over or whatever. And if that's a monthly chart, then obviously it could take a few months. OK, I've had a request to talk about running trades. Uh, sorry, adding to winning trades. <laughs> that was what the, t the, uh, the request was. So adding to winning trades. Um, how do you do it? When do you do it? Etc, etc. So firstly, I... I, I, you don't get to add to winning trades on every trade by any stretch of the imagination. It's only a, a lower, a low percentage of your winning trades do you actually usually, or certainly the way that I do it, get the opportunity to add into. So the way that it tends to work is that if I bring the pen up, if I've if I've got in here, and my initial stop loss is down here. So there's my stop loss. Here's my entry. And the first thing, in order for a trade to qualify for an add-in trade, it means the target's got to be like way up here, <laughs> probably off the off the screen still. Um, so it has to be that I have um, a, a big piece of analysis where I'm looking for a much bigger um, overall run. Okay. Now that could still be on a. It doesn't matter what the time frame is. So don't think, oh, it's got to be, you've got to be in a position that you're going to hold for months and months. No, no, it could be that you're trading over a, off an hourly chart and that you're seeing scope for a, a big run based on that time frame. So it doesn't matter what the time frame is. It's more about that you can see relative to your entry and stop loss, you can see a big run. So effectively, a what would be a good risk reward ratio trade. So you've got in here and the market started going up okay you can't actually add into your trade until you've got your stop loss to break even on the first on the off the first entry so un unless of course your initial entry was undersized but let's assume that you risk 1% max per trade and you've risked 1% on this first entry then you can't actually add to your position until your stop loss has been moved up to break even and this is where it gets tricky because you've got to be really careful of moving that stop loss to break even too soon because if you do that then what all that could happen is the market could come back down nick you out and then go back up again so you've got to have given the trade enough room to breathe so that um, it surpassed the point whereby okay it's you, you've given it enough slack um, even if it does a pullback now um, it shouldn't want to come back 
and, and nick you out just to then go higher again. It's come up enough. So if I can give you an example, um, let me think of an example now. <laughs> um, back in 2014, I was trading, fun enough, the S&P. Well, it was the, actually, it was the Dow, but we'll use the S&P as an example. So let me just wind back the charts to 2014 on the S&P. And I was trading this with our members at the time. Uh, da, da, da. It was quite a big trade, actually. It was a, yeah, it was a six-figure trade, actually. It was... Um, is that it? 2014. Yeah. An interesting thing was, okay, there's two things about this trade, actually. The first thing that I must mention is that in 2014, if you look at your Forex charts and go back and have a look, um, we the first three months of the year were fine. We're good. First three months, um, basically until Easter. And then um, 2014, we the volatility um, just fell off a cliff, um, or, or the average ranges fell off a cliff. So what we saw is euro dollar, pound dollar, all of their average ranges came right down. Um, the market never woke up after Easter, so it was like it went away for the Easter holidays and never came back, and didn't come back until really the end of September of that year. So in, in that period of 2014, I hardly made it. I couldn't make any money, and so I was pretty much flat through that period. Um, and you're like, well, that's just gone from April through to September. But that's the reality of trading. I was only talking about this the other day, actually. Um, that's the reality of trading is that you don't always make money every single month. That's just not always the way it is. You have some months, you can have a, a, a six-month stretch where you, have, you just win every month or make money every month, should I say. Um, and then you could have a period of you know, five months where you go sideways. Okay, doesn't mean to say there's anything wrong. Um, that's just the nature of returns. The nature of returns is that they are um, random. Even if you're using a um, a structured approach um, to your trading, that any trading system or strategy is going to go through periods where it's flat or whether it's actually in drawdown. So, but you have to put up with those, and you know, and and um, so that you're there for the times when it's you know having a purple patch. So anyway, so I'd gone through a period where I hadn't made any money from since April. Um, it seemed like, oh, okay, this is quite a long period, really. But anyway, I got this a, a trade-off on the S&P, and there's a funny story around this. I had some some signals for me to short, and actually, I, I don't know why I've got the S&P up, because I actually did it on the Dow. Um, um, but anyway, so I had some sell signals that came in, and I believe I sold on this update. It was... Like I said, it's the S&P, so the Dow would have been slightly different, but it's pretty much the same. So I think I sold on this day here. And um, so, I had, like I said, I had these signals came in. The markets had been doing really well. They're at new all-time highs. My parents had just invested more money into their investments. And I thought, well, with my mum and dad's market timing, when they put money into the markets, we're probably getting toppy. <laughs> So, and I am joking here, but there's an element of truth that you know that when your average investor is putting more money in because they've seen that the stock markets have been doing really well, then <laughs> then maybe if they were a barometer for the rest of the uh, the global investment community, then you know that there's going to be lots of people doing the similar sort of thing. Anyway, it wasn't the reason, but I was joking with our traders at the time about that. And I said, well, if they've gone in now, right near the highs, then um, literally they'd gone in in the, I think in the summer, in the August. And um, I say gone in, they'd added to the investments. So um, anyway, so I had these sell signals coming in. And before any of you say, oh, Charlie, why don't you give your mum and dad some advice? No, no, no. They do long-term investing. They are an, you know, an, of a certain age. They're not traders. I'm not trying to get them to market time. I just, you know, they... You know, they invest for the longer term, and so they have a financial advisor who gives them advice on that. So it's not timing's not as important to them. And as we can see, since 2014, the markets have gone much, much higher. So anyway, um, I don't give them advice on things like that because it's long-term investing. It's very different, and it has all sorts of um, diversification going on as well. So anyway, so I sold the the Dow and. Um, and I saw the opportunity 
um, to add because my target, fun enough, was right down here. Actually, I'm going to press pause. I'm going to take it to the Dow. Hold on. Okay, so I've got the Dow. As you can see, it's a very similar looking chart. And um, the yeah, the, the target was, was down here. It was based on some long-term trend lines at the time and some other mean reversion tools that I use. So I could see that having got in up here, let's bring the pen up, so I'd got in, some, I think here, not apt, uh, not right at the highs. So I got in here, and my stop was here. So I could, and my target was down around about sixteen thousand, something like that. So again, like I've just given you in that first example, I could see the potential for um, adding into this trade. So I got in here, and the market came down. Um, uh, I still I can't remember what point I moved my stop but certainly once it had come down a bit I then did start to trail that stop down which then enabled me to put um, to start adding more into my trade and it was funny when I remember we got down to here you see this doji bar here and our members at the time were saying oh Charlie you can can you see you know there's a there's a there's a reversal bar here should we bank some profits and it's the one thing with when you're calling trades to other people is that they and it's nothing wrong with what they're doing but they will ask questions they'll say oh should we bank some here even though you've told them no no my target's down there around about 16,000 the burning you know they're sitting there at this stage on a nice profit they've got in whenever whatever level it was and then it's run down to this zone then they've seen a doji reversal and I'm like well no yes it is a reversal bar but we're gonna have but I would need to hold because I'm seeing this bigger picture right okay then of course we have this big up bar and um, and then they're like oh Charlie do you think it's gonna come all the way back up now should we just bail out literally I mean it's not everyone was saying it's just one person or two people at the time saying oh Charlie should come out. and I'm like no I'm, I'm adding in here <laughs> So I'm adding in here. You don't need to add in, but I'm adding in here. And so, and then it went on like this, and it became a fascinating story, really, of trader psychology. Because what I get to see is, in a very small way, is I get to see trader psychology, trader mindset, by the things that our members ask me at various times when we're in trades together. So it gives me a real good snapshot of um, the way that traders think um, and not just our own traders obviously but it gives me it keeps me in touch with what um, traders around the world think um, at, at given times so anyway um, so I'd added in here because my stop was down and um, and then and then yeah and then again we had this big up bar here and I remember the panic in I say panic but you know again traders saying oh do you think we should come out now then Charlie because now it's had that down bar and it's had a it's a it's a it's a bullish engulfing type bar now Charlie um should we now come out and I'm like well it is but this is a daily chart and the Dow you know and the S&P you know they do behave like that they will volatility's picked up and they will behave like that so now I'm gonna I'm gonna have to hold with my with my view because that's the trade and of course um and then it came straight back down the next day and then the rest is sort of pretty much history it, I think in the end um, on this day, on this plunge day into the air, in the end, um, I can't remember the the exits. I didn't get out right at the lows anyway. And you 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 exit and you think, blimey, that's had another you know few hundred points to the downside. Um, but you can't get it all. And um, but anyway, that's a good example of being of adding in. The main point is you've got to have a target which is far away. If you've only got a target which is one to two risk reward, you're not going to be having chance to add into your position. So it's only on those trades. Now this could have been an hourly chart, like I said, or it could have been a daily chart as this was. So it doesn't matter what the time frame is, as providing your risk to reward, your your target is far enough away and that you you've got that opportunity to move the stop to break even, then by all means, yes, um, do then look at adding in. Um, those are my favorite trades, I'll say that right now. That when um, I get what I call a thematic trade, so that's a trade where I'm riding a theme over a longer period. It's not just a, a, you know, a short three, four day um, swing trade. It's a trade where 
I can see the potential for a multi-month move. They don't come along very often, but when they do come along, those are the ones that, that interest me the most because I see the potential to add in. And I, I love the idea of adding in because it actually, if any of you have added into trades, winning trades before, psychologically it's quite tough. Why? Because you're already in a nice profit from where you got in. So you've, if I bring the pen up again, you've got into a trade like in this one over here and you've got down to here and you're already sitting in a nice profit and you're thinking, yeah, but if I add in now and then it comes back up, I'm going to end up, it's going to be a losing trade. If I just stay with my original position and have my stop at break even, I can't lose. But by adding into my trade, I now, I'm now opening myself up to the trade still becoming a loser. And um, so you have all these other psychological aspects to to adding into trade as well, trades as well which i love i embrace that sort of stuff so um because i find that's a great challenge to say right you know we gotta we gotta put some more risk on so to speak now it's not more than the one percent initial but it's now i'm not going to stay a, a you know a break even you know that i can't lose on this trade i'm going to put another another unit in and so now i can lose on the trade again and so from a psychological trader mindset perspective, I find that um, a great challenge to then build and build and build. And there was one last example. I know this is a longer video here today. There was another example, um, which funny enough was on the euro dollar. Um, so if we go to the euro daily chart, yeah. And if we go back to the euro dollar in 2017, this was a thematic trade. Yeah whereby I'd got in on the euro dollar over here somewhere um, at the beginning of 2017 and that was another trade where I, I overall had a target right up at sort of 114 so it, it got up to 114 look, look I've still got the, the original uh, horizontal um, resistance line that I was targeting look, that, around 114 up there so that was um, again uh, a trade where you know, you're I'm treating it as um, the potential to add in. So I would hold a core. I don't get me wrong. I banked quite a bit of profit when we got up to this zone because we were diverging quite a lot. Um, so and so I banked or did I just sell? I, know, I remember I was selling, so I hedged here. Then it came down, released the hedge on the way down. So um, I must have banked some as well. But then ho always held on to a core position. And and then added over here, I think after this up bar here, I added on these three and then I added again on these pullbacks here. And it was just that was totally engrossing for me mentally. It was a, a, a wonderful mentally stimulating trade for several months, really the first uh, five or six months of that year. And so where I just had that mental stimulus for managing a trade like that. But like I said, a trade like that won't come along all of the time but um but when they do they're great they're great to be able to do it so um there you go that's a whole subject on um adding into winning trades but um certainly you know, i tend to on this one the irony is i looked at the trade overall when i when i finally closed out of all positions because i sort of taken some profits off here then added in again through uh, added more in through here then took some more profits off here at the daily 200 and it pulled back again and then I had to take some off more off here ahead of the French elections because we never knew which way it was going to gap um, but then added it again after the gap and so basically just traded that, that held a core position but then traded the other positions through all of this so adding in then taking off adding in and taking off um, I got to the end of the year also once we got up to the 114 zone and looked at it and thought, yeah, if I'd have just held the core position and not done a thing the whole time, I'd have made more money. <laughs> so um, that's the, I talked about this recently about being a busy fool in trading, but it felt good because I was busy. <laughs> but um, yeah, if I'd have just held on to it. But the, there is a slight caveat to that. By me trading it, um, at some of these times when we'd had the pullbacks and then I was looking for reversals before getting back in again, if I'd have just held the, 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 the core position, 
I never would have made anything. If it had have just rolled over completely, I never would have made anything. By trading in and out a little bit, if it had have rolled over, then I would have still sat there having made something. So I guess that's the difference. Anyway, um, I've rattled on for 20 minutes now. I'm going to leave you to it. Have a good day and the rest of the week. I'll be back in touch over the weekend.